I remember when I was in college, I was late for a meeting. It was in the afternoon. I had just exercised, and I was quick throwing on my clothes in my dorm, and I raced off to the student center 15 minutes late for a student missions council meeting. It was in a long, narrow conference room, and I walked in, and there were about 20 people sitting in there, and the only seat left open was at the other end of the room. And so I walked past everybody. I sat down, and I looked up, and most of the people around the table were looking at me and smiling. And so I felt really good. I felt encouraged, and I began to enter into the meeting with extra enthusiasm. And then about 10 minutes later, I looked down, and uh, the zipper on my gray pants was all the way down. <laughs> and my red shirt was sticking out through the zipper <laughs> like a flag. So I went from everyone's excited to see me to everyone thinks you're an idiot in less than one second. <laughs> And I don't know if you would call that humility. I think I would just say it was humiliation because it took a few years before that was funny for me. It was extremely painful at the time. I think of that story or that experience when I think of my own pride because it's the easiest thing to see in other people. It's the hardest thing to see in yourself. It hides. It's the ultimate egg on the face. Somebody has said, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. And um, when, the more proud we are, the more we recognize it and hate it in other people when we see it. And there's a lot of proud people in the world, so our pride is right out there for everyone to see, and mine is uh, very visible to you. It's just hard to talk about it. It's hard to share it with someone else. It's hard to help somebody else with their own humility. It's too personal, but God has a way of doing that. And so this is uh, the subject today, pride. I'm up here on a stage, elevated. I'm up here in the lights. Sometimes the lights are so bright on me, I can hardly see all of you. And this is uh, another good picture for what pride is like if you're looking for it in your life because you, you want to have the much more attractive quality of humility. Well, pride is being on the stage in the lights all the time, wherever you go. And the focus and the energy and the time is all about you. And in the shadows are God and other people. And there's just no time or very little time and energy left over for them. And people, when they recognize this, they're not excited about a life wrapped up in itself. In fact, one of my favorite teachers said, a life wrapped up in itself is a very small package. Proverbs 6, 16 gives us a list of the things, the seven things God hates. And do you know what the first thing is on God's list? We all have our lists, and our lists are, they're disproportional to how bad those sins are. But God's list starts with what? Haughty eyes. And isn't it interesting, when we wake up in the morning and open our little peepers, we give away right off our pride. When you look at people, you either look up to them or down on them. And uh, so I would ask you this, just so it's another place you can recognize pride. When you look at people, how do you look at them? And I want to especially ask you, how do you look at the people who have less than you? How do you look at the people who have less than you when it comes to money? How do you look at poor people? How do you look at people who have less education, who have less beauty, people who have less talent, less popularity? Find someone who is the least of these and just notice in the mirror, how do you look at these folks? How could we possibly look down on others just because God has given us more than them? How could that ever be a reason that we would think we're better more important, more significant, more worthy of time and energy than, than any one other human being. That would be pride, and pride is the ultimate egg on the face, the ultimate sin that God hates. It's on God's short list at the top. And it forgets all that God is, all that God has done, and all that he's given us. When we go back and trace the origin of evil, which we can't do fully, but when we try to in the scripture, we go to the Garden of Eden and we see the sin of desire, where Adam and Eve take the forbidden fruit and eat it. But if we look at it more closely, they weren't just hungry, they weren't just desiring the taste of the fruit. They wanted to be like God and know the difference between good and evil, and that was the clincher. It was pride that caused them to bite. But evil was already existing in the garden in the form of the snake. So we go back even further and we see even more clearly, all sins come from pride. And this was true with 
The snake, Satan, Lucifer, was God's most beautiful angel. Somewhere in the abundance, in the overabundance of God's blessing, he was led astray to imagine that that was was himself and that he could begin to act and think and, and move independently of God and wanted to compete and be as high as God. And so how ironic that the blessings of God would lead Lucifer astray. But God cast him down to earth and a third of the angels. And so pride is what made the devil the devil. It's a serious thing. It's the ultimate Petri Petri dish from which all evil comes and is formed. We can focus on other sins, but they all come from pride. Well, the good news this morning from Daniel is that God can overcome pride and he does it millions and millions of times. It's how he builds his kingdom. And the story today is a chance for us all to look in the mirror at the ultimate king of the world, King Nebuchadnezzar, and hear his testimony, his God story, his baptism video. A ruthless king of a pagan empire gets to actually write a chapter of the Bible, God's inspired word. God did this miracle and changed this proud man. And he said, now I want you to be a part of my my word for all my people for, for thousands of years. I want him to hear your story. And so as we, as we receive this chapter in the first person from Nebuchadnezzar himself, um, we see pride and hopefully can see it in our own lives a little more clearly and God can humble us. The more we're humble, the better we are. The more people will like us, the more influence we can have, the more our life and its value goes up. So as we, as we read about this, I want to get into it because I can't read the whole story. It's so long, and I've been struggling in this series with Daniel to not read 50, 60 verses of story. So I'm going to summarize some of the story. I want you to read it later. I hope you'll get excited about it, go back and dig into it. But let me just catch you up to the best part of the story, and we'll read that on the screen. And you can look at that in your, in your Bible. Um, but, but what happened is chapter 4 begins, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. And again, he's troubled by the dream, especially since he has an inkling of what the interpretation will be, and it's his own humiliation. It's his own demise. This is not a complicated dream like in chapter 2 where he wanted the wise men to even guess the dream, and then it's very complicated in interpretation. This time it's simple. It's obvious. And, and yet it's much more troubling to the wise men and even Daniel to try to interpret it to this king because it's so hard to give him the bad news. In the dream, the king uh, sees a great tree, and the tree is a shelter for the birds that come and nest and for the animals that come under its branches, and it's a great tree that spreads over the whole earth. But then a holy one, a messenger, stands and commands that the tree would be cut down, and, and yet that the roots, the stump, would be banded with iron and with bronze. And then it shifts from the tree and begins to talk that it's obviously a man. And in the dream, he, it says, will lose his mind and he will be driven from humanity until he has realized that the Most High is Lord over all the kingdoms of the world and that he gives them to whomever he pleases and that he even takes the lowliest of men and places those men over these kingdoms. Now, that's the dream. That's what Nebuchadnezzar describes that he dreamed, and he's looking for the meaning. To me, the meaning would be very obvious. He calls in his wise men. He calls in all those guys, that's, and they don't have a clue because they're not going to stand and tell the king what the obvious meaning is. And so he calls in Daniel. And Daniel, it says, is perplexed by the dream, and he's terrified. And he says to King Nebuchadnezzar, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, if only this dream were, only, were true of your enemies and not of you. And then King Nebuchadnezzar says, Daniel, don't worry. Don't be troubled. Just tell me what it means. I trust you. I know that in you dwells the spirit of the gods. And so Daniel finally gets the courage and speaks up. And that's where we pick up the story. And guys, let's just start with verse 25. Um, He finally looks at the king in verse 22 and he says, you, your majesty, you are that tree. 
And then we pick up the story in verse 25. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when, when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. Immediately what, and now we go to verse 33, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of, of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Isn't that an amazing testimony? When you realize that's coming from a king, when you realize that's coming from the ruler of the world of that time, when you realize this man was cruel, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he wasn't just your typical overachiever. He was the king of the world. He, was, he built what would become perhaps the most incredible city in history as his own personal residence. One of the seven wonders of the world were his hanging gardens that he constructed. Uh, he had the power that only a half dozen in the people in all of history have ever known. And his life still fell apart, and he was glad it did, and he praised God. Amen. And the end. It's an amazing story. Somebody completely at the top goes down and becomes a beast for seven years and then is given back his life only now with the gift of humility. The gift to be able to, to be in the midst of the same things and receive it all as a gift from God. And we can see in both of those instances and in his God story with a before and after what pride looks like and how God's able to humble it. And I hope and pray that he'll do the same thing for each one of us. We desperately need to have the pride that Nebuchadnezzar knocked out of us. And God can do that in so many wonderful ways. Well, the first thing I want to say is, look, what is pride? Let's just look at it, ask that question. And especially as we consider uh, Nebuchadnezzar, why was God so angry? What, what was he opposing so aggressively in Nebuchadnezzar? Well, did you notice the verse that I emphasized, verse 30? That when he walked out just before his demise, he walked out on the, on the balcony. Do you notice the personal pronouns was I, me, my? Too much first person? First person singular, not enough we, us, you, God. When you write an annual report for your business, when you, when you do an annual review for your job, you shouldn't just say, look me, look what I did. You should be able to say, you know, God worked and this is what I am thankful for. Words that acknowledge the presence, the existence. Oh, and I'm so glad to have a team and I'm so glad for those who have helped me. And you see how that's just so much more people, they feel like they're recognized and they see that you're acknowledging the things you obviously have received from God. That's so much more endearing than pride. Me, my, me, stuck on self. And so we see that in verse 30. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar looked at all the things in his life. He said, I did it and I'm do it. You want to see pride in the mirror? You want to see pride in this story? She's looking at your life and you, you basically just say, I did it. 
and I'm do it. I deserve it. People should stop and take notice of this, and then I should be receiving what I'm receiving and more. And, and this is, of course, a complete deception, and it makes God the, ang the most angry because he looks down and sees how ridiculous it is. So we'll say if things are going well, pride will say, I worked harder and smarter and was more moral than everyone else, and therefore I deserve everything that I have. So there's no joy in it because it's just like you got your paycheck. Instead of going, I'm nothing, I am a sinner, everything I have is undeserved and freely given to me by God. It's surprising, it's wonderful, I'm discovering it every day. Look at this, look at this, oh my goodness, I didn't expect it. It just arrived, surprising to me. No. I look at all this stuff, it's like Christmas every day, and I'm like, yeah, I should be having more. Because look at me, look all I've done, look at all I am. It's all expected, it's all deserved, and it ruins the joy of prosperity. Or if things aren't going well, or if they're going badly, we say, well, I'm having a harder life than other people, and that's not fair. I'm not getting something that I am owed. I should have more. And so it sucks the ability, sucks the joy out of prosperity, but it also keeps us from being able to, to be thankful and, and close to God when we're in trials and difficulties because we're just feeling like we should get more. And in fact, we don't deserve anything. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment. Anything we have, anything we've been given is grace. It's dessert. It's gravy. It's extra. And that's the way humility is. A humble person is just looking around, recognizing God's goodness all the time, and none of it is deserved, and they're just thrilled. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a reason in our world standards to think that he earned everything he had. He was, after all, the greatest military genius of his era. He risked his life every time there was a battle, every time there was a, a military threat, and he went into battle. He wasn't an armchair general. He got in the chariot. He went out front, and he fought mightily, and his team won his country. His empire was the world ruling empire. He may be one of the greatest political leaders in history. So what would be so bad about him saying he accomplished his life and he deserves some respect for it? What's wrong with that? Well, I got this illustration from a pastor named Tim Keller, but I'm going to use it and put myself into it as if, as if I was the one, uh, it, it, but he actually gave this illustration initially. What if someone composed a beautiful song and I stole it? Okay, I didn't compose it, but I told everybody that I wrote it and people were amazed. And they're like, oh my goodness, Dean, you can preach, but my goodness, you have such musical ability. You're so multi-talented. And I was like, well, no, stop, stop. <laughs> okay, and the person who wrote the song, who wrote the beautiful song, finds out they would rightfully be outraged. And if everybody else found out, they would look at me and they would think, you have robbed the person who wrote this of their due. You have claimed the credit for someone else's work now, you see, this is what we do every time we're proud. I don't care what it is we think we've done. If we take the credit for it, we're taking God's credit, God's glory for his work. Let's go through a few examples. And this comes out. We did not choose our race. We did not choose our gender. We did not choose the century in which we were born. We had nothing to do with the fact that we're born here and that we're born now and not in the 14th century during the bubonic plague. No control over that. What about the uh, parents or the siblings that we had? Did we, we didn't choose that. We didn't choose our early childhood experiences when we were barely self-aware, and we all admit those are such formative years. That was not us. What proud person could claim credit for that? And then some people say, well, but, but I worked so hard. Yeah. With what? with the mind, the talents, the abilities, the friendships, the connections that God and God alone has given us. As we sang, even the breath in our lungs, God gives us the heartbeat. He gives us our blood pressure, our vital signs. He is sustaining creation and we're part of that creation. How could we ever think we made ourselves? 
And if we're Christians, for those of us who know Jesus, how about the opportunity to hear the gospel? Do we control that? No. And then our response to it, that we could see it, realize its importance, and respond, that our eyes were opened, that our heart was flooded with his light, and then we get our sins forgiven, we get to live forever when we die, we get to escape the judgment, we get spiritual gifts for ministry, we get close relationships with other Christian believers, all the stuff that we enjoy is a gift. And we could not create, claim credit for any of it. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God's work. Paul puts it so well in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 and 7. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? And when you know that, and you're grateful for that, you're humble. And when we don't, when we forget, we're all hung up with ourselves, whether we love ourselves or we hate ourselves, it's still being stuck on ourselves and it's pride either way. It's pride. Me, my, me, I, look at me, me, me. Our social, social media culture is promoting this, isn't it? Can you see that with selfies and with your own page on the web and how many likes? Isn't that encouraging narcissism as if we needed any encouragement? And we just recognize this strong tendency and it goes back to the very beginning of evil. Well, the vivid image of Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of the world, becoming insane like an animal with long fingernails. I, I, I was, I've heard this story since I was a little kid, and I've, I, I've never gotten that image out of my mind. This great world ruler, I'm trying to imagine him with hair growing out, looking like an acting. God just stepped on his mental air hose, and he goes out for seven years until he gets the lesson. But, you know, that wasn't just something that God did to him. That's what pride does to all of us. Pride is dehumanizing. Two great human qualities, compassion and joy, are completely taken away from us by our pride. We can't be compassionate and sensitive. This is one of the most human qualities because we're so stuck on ourselves. We've spent all our time, our energy on ourselves. We don't have any leftover for others and, 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 and all this stuff. And so we lose that. We are defaced. We're more like an animal when it comes to having that human quality taken out of our life. And joy is, is another wonderful human, uniquely human quality. And pride just takes that away. And so we're all made like a beast through our pride. And the potential for our humanity being made in the image of God especially is thwarted uh, by our pride and enhanced by our humility. So this is then a little bit from the story, what is pride? Pride is all the energy and time on yourself and very little for others and God. Takes the credit for God's work and it keeps you from being compassionate, joyful, thankful. It's very repulsive to others. It's the easiest thing to see in others, but the hardest thing to see in yourself. Well, now, just two takeaways from the story, particularly if we've looked at the, uh, the reflection of pride and Nebuchadnezzar. My first takeaway from the story and the way it seems to go with Neb's story, first takeaway, God can give anyone humility. And he's gonna humble everyone. I'm not talking about that. Next chapter is one of the, the scariest chapters on judgment I've ever read in my life. Belshazzar will be done that night. When the hand's on the wall, he's, he's through. He's dead. His, his kingdom ends that night. He gives, he's not even given a chance to respond to God because he was under greater judgment as the descendant of King Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody will be humbled by God in judgment, but this is different. This is receiving the gift of humility so that you're given your life back and it's so much better because you can handle it all with thankfulness and gratefulness and point the glory to God and use it to help and bless other people. This is a wonderful gift and I'm saying, if God can give it to Nebuchadnezzar, he can give it to any of us, anyone. Nebuchadnezzar was an evil king. He put a window on his fiery furnace and used it regularly. 
He, he, he plundered God's temple in Jerusalem and took the vessels and stuck them in the temple of his pagan gods. He, he stole Daniel away from his family and his, his country. And, 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 and that was the instrument through which he would come to this, this story, come to his, his gift of humility. Is that God's grace or what? That one of your captives that you've been so cruel to would lead you to God, would lead you to faith. This is such a wonderful thing. God gives the gift of humility, and then you can still have your life not uh, healed of the cancer of pride. It's a wonderful and amazing thing. It happens every time someone becomes a, a Christian. We can talk about that in this light. Um, it's a miracle. That's why we like to call Sunday morning, you know, the happening. We like to think of this time coming every week as something we pray for, something we don't deserve, something that God is doing, and we're just feeling the wind blowing and the spirit moving. And why? Because it's got to it's gotta be a miracle that we come in here and God of heaven knocks the Nebuchadnezzar out of us, knocks the pride out of us so we can celebrate and we can be inspired and encouraged and all these other wonderful things. But there's got to be more. There's got to be a sense of, of, oh, God, please. Knock, knock some things out of me. Correct me. As I come, I don't want to just celebrate. I want to, I want to confess. I want to be in awe. I want to revere you. I want your greatness to, to cower me and to put me in my place. And I will give you the glory and I will reach my ultimate potential as, as I look away from myself and look away from all of my concerns. Every Sunday, that can happen right here. And you know, God is building his kingdom all over the world. Every time one more person trusts Jesus, they're given the gift of humility. And every time someone doesn't, their pride seals their fate. Proud people pass right by the gospel. Who says I'm a sinner? I don't agree. I'm not so bad, especially compared to other people. Who says there's a judgment to be saved from? That's not what I think. That's not my opinion about God, about the future, about people. There's no real problem or urgency. I'm okay. I don't need help from God or anyone else. I'm doing fine on my own. I'm not going to receive a gift that will obligate me. I'm not going to receive a gift where I'm going to have to say thank you the rest of my life and give up control of my life to the person who's actually given me what I never could have given myself. And it's so easy to see it. Pride seals their fate. Pride is what sends people to hell. Prize what keeps people from receiving the gospel and having their sins forgiven. And you can see why God hates it so much. It's that tendency in all of us to just kind of move away from God. I'm fine without you, but I'd like to even be greater than you. I've got a better idea than you for my life. I've got a better idea than your word, than your wisdom, than your spirit would tell me, would share with me. And in the minute we do that, we die. We're a branch that comes out of the vine and we are no longer fruitful. Our life is no longer meaningful. But God turns people like that around all the time. Every time someone becomes a Christian, what we are reading with Nebuchadnezzar happens. Scales fall from the eyes, and there's a huge realization that hasn't been there for their whole life. And, and so everybody, so many people could write this kind of a chapter. Before, after, God came to me, he gave me humility. Now my life has meaning. People are drawn to me. My life is so much better because I'm not stuck on myself. The gift of humility that gives the opportunity for there still to be a meaningful life. He's still doing that. He can give that to anyone. When you're praying, don't, don't hesitate because if you're praying for someone you think is far from God, God can do it. The takeaway too, and the last one for this morning is simply, let the sermon be enough. See, Nebuchadnezzar was an example in the first point of receiving the gift of humility, of having this amazing change, but he's also a warning, clear warning. He's someone for whom the sermon was not enough. And so he had to have the tragic, painful, dehumanizing experience to really change that took seven years of his life, drenched with the dew of heaven, insane, the shame. My dad's always said that Experience is not the best teacher, but it's a very convincing teacher, and, and we never forget the things that we had to experience pain to learn, but it also cost a great deal 
It's a heavy price to pay if you have to go that route, if you have to have the God actually come and humble you. Now, he'll say, humble yourself under my mighty hand, but if that's not enough and you don't, to, the sermon's not enough, that he's going to come and humble you and it'll hurt. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt others. It'll waste your life, so, so big chunks of your life. And so this is the last point. Let the sermon be enough. Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream that was prophetic, that got through to him, that terrified him. Then he was given Daniel as a spirit-filled man to come interpret it for him and not only give him the meaning, but to say, plead with him. He was like, Nebuchadnezzar, if you just repent and you start reaching out to the poor and, and you just change your ways, and then maybe this dream and all of its doom and gloom, maybe it won't have to happen to you. So, so Daniel was pleading intensely with Nebuchadnezzar, but it wasn't enough. We don't know what he said. It's not recorded in the story. What he said when Daniel was over with the interpretation, the pleading and his own fearing for his own life, he, he, he confirms it to the king. Yes, this is bad news. Yes, it's about you. And, and so I'm telling you, just, just change, repent, king. And I don't know what he said. He, he probably said something like, good sermon, pastor. I respect you. I'm glad you got that off your chest, Daniel. And then he goes for another year. And he's all praise me on the balcony and God just brings him down into the field. See, the sermon wasn't enough. And there are so many Daniel spirit-filled channels in our life, family members who've been an example to us, who have challenged us, who have prayed for us. We come to church, we go to small group, we have so many circumstances and conscience and the Holy Spirit's conviction in our life. So many of these sources, I'm just saying, let them be enough. Don't keep resisting and then thinking, well, God hasn't done anything. Maybe it's been 12 months and I seem to be okay. Don't misunderstand the patience of God and think that he condones the sin. It's really his forbearance and his patience giving you that chance. Will the sermon be enough? Will the conscience be enough? <laughs> or do you have to have the dehumanizing experience? And, uh, of course, the challenge is not to have to have that. First Peter 5, 5 and 6, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, not have to bring you down and humble you. If you humble yourself, then all he has to do is lift you up. But if you don't humble yourself, then he will do that for you. If he loves you, if he's your father, and he wants to move you to a life and a path of blessing, Every time we remember the dramatic example of an insane king grazing in a field, a picture of all the pain, the waste, the tragedy, and the irreversible scars for those for whom the sermon is not enough. Let the sermon be enough. And then finally, I'll just say by conclusion, when we gather, whether it's our pleasure or our problems, we need him to humble us, whether it's a good day or a bad day, good week or a bad week. We just need to come and see him in the lights and then others again for their importance in our life. And then, oh Lord, shrink us, shrink this swollen vision, this view, this concept that we have way, way too large about ourselves. And may he set us free to praise him and serve others and give us the genuine quality of humility. Well, we're going to worship now and and hope that happens, and then we'll remember the Lord Jesus, our most humble Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We, we want you to humble us. We want to be um, aware and excited about you and others and what they need more than ourselves. Set us free. Uh, give us the gift of humility, just like with Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you for his God story, his testimony. Lord, we pray our lives would be a very similar uh, testimony where we're able to be so much better for you. I pray that in this time right now as we worship, that you would fill our minds and our hearts with you and not ourselves. Uh, bless us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.